Yea, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Say, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, the focus here is that we are more than conquerors, but I want to really focus on those three words. We are more. We are more. I want everybody to say that out loud. Say, I am more. Well, there's something that happens when you discover that you are more. What are you more than? Well, you're more than your past. You're more than your pain. You're more than your history. You're more than your upbringing. You're more than your greatest successes and you're more than your greatest failures. You're more than the greatest hurt you've ever felt and you're more than the greatest thrill that you've ever felt. You are more than your education. You are more than your degree. You are more than your social status. You are more than your financial status. You are more than your race. You are more than your color. You are more than black. You are more than white. You are more than a Republican. You are more than a Democrat. You are more than an American. You are more. You are more. You are more. You are more than what you are more than whatever anybody has done to you. All I got to say to you today is good morning. You are more. You are more. Say, I am more. Boy, we sometimes feel less. We feel like we're less than the challenge that is in front of us. We're less than what the devil's trying to do to us. We're less than what God has for us. We're less than, than something that's been done to us. We're less than what the devil's trying to do. We're less than what we'd want to be. But I've got good news for you. You are far more than anything you've ever imagined yourself to be. You are far, far more than anything you think about yourself right now. You are more than a conqueror. You are more than victorious. You are more than an overcomer. You are more than whatever dis ability you grew up with. You are more than whatever flaw is in your life. You're more than your appearance. You're more than your beauty. You're more than your ugly. You're more, you're more, you're more. You're more than your size. You're more than your weight. You're more than your height. Somebody was sharing with me the other day. They, they, they said, you know, I'm, I'm short and I always feel a little less, like I'm at a disadvantage because of my size, you know. And I like to say to all of the, my short people here today, would you stand if you're short? To, oh, you're already standing. Okay. <laughs> you're more than your height. And, and this person was telling me, I, I just feel like I, I have to, you know, overcome so much more because of my height. And you would think, I, I would have thought, I, I even said to him, you're not even that short, man. But we have an image of ourselves. We see ourselves smaller. We see ourselves shorter. We see ourselves poorer. We see ourselves sicker than we are. But you're more than your health right now. You're more than the doctor's report. You're more than your bank statement. You're more than your financial status. You're more than your current circumstances. You're more than all of hell that has broken loose against you. Perhaps all hell has broken loose. Perhaps you've been hit from every trial you can imagine. Yet God says you're more than that. You're more than that trial. You're more than that test. You're more than the sum total of your life experiences. You're more than the disadvantages that you grew up with. You're more than the tone of your skin color. You're more than your history. You are more than your pain. You are more than your past. Are you getting an idea of what we're talking about today? You are more. Say, I am more. You're more than your education. You're more than your name. You're more than your gifts. You're more than your talent. You're more than your appearance. You're more than what's been done to you. You're more, you're more, you're, mo you're more. So why aren't people walking in this? Because they just don't know it. They're limited by their experiences. They're limited by the labels that have been given to them. They're limited by what they've called themselves or what others have called them. I know people that grew up in school where they were told by a teacher, you're, you're stupid and you'll never amount to anything. If we can imagine that teachers actually have said these things, parents have said these things to their kids. 
People have said it to one another that's called bullying. And we don't need to be pushed around by anybody's opinion of us. We don't need to be pushed around by anybody's words over us. We're not confined and we don't have to be defined by what people's labels and what people have said about us or our culture or our upbringing or all people from that area of the country are like this or all people from that uh, part of the world are like this or that all people, all women are like this or all men are like this. And we got to stop labeling people and stop generalizing. We are not what people have defined us as we are more. And I'm not just saying that you're that that, that, that there's more um, that you're that you're made to do more. I'm saying you you are more. It's not just what you're supposed to do. It's who you are. You are more than the challenge you're facing right now. You're more than the frustration you're going through right now. You're more than the mistake that you made. You're more than the mistake your husband made. You're more than the mistake your wife made. You're more than the mistake your parents made. You're more than whatever anybody has done to you. Whatever anybody has done to you, you are more. Say it, I am more. You know, there's this great song from a few years ago by uh, 10th Avenue North, and it's called You Are More, and the lyrics go like this. There's a girl in the corner with tear stains on her eyes from the places she's wandered and the shame she can't hide. She says, how did I get here? I'm not who I once was. I'm crippled by the fear that I've fallen too far to love. But the song goes on to say, but don't you know who you are? What's been done for you? Yeah, don't you know who you are? You are more than the choices that you've made. You're more than the sum of your past mistakes. It goes on to say you're more than the problems you create. You've been, you've been remade. Because this is not about what you've done, but it's about what's been done for you. This is not about where you've been, but where your brokenness brings you to. This is not about what you feel, but what he felt to forgive you and what he felt to make you loved. You are more than your feelings right now. You're more than the schizophrenia you're going through. And so are you. <laughs> Some of you get that later. You're more than the mental illness that they said you are or that you have. You're more than the disability that they said you possess. You're more than the disease that they said you've been diagnosed with. You're more, you're more, you're more. You're more than your IQ. You're more than what they said you'll amount to because you plus you might not amount to very much, but you plus Jesus amounts to more than this world could ever possibly know. You're more. You're more, you're more, you are more. And it's time that we attack the mindset that tells us we're not more, that I'm not more than this disease, this disease is gonna kill me, that I'm not more than this addiction, this addiction is going to kill me. You know, you are not your addiction. You might have an addiction, but you're not that addiction. You know what I mean by that? You know, they, the, the, and I'm all, I believe, in, I believe in the steps and even 12 steps in some cases. One of them is the, the, the step of acceptance. I believe it's okay to accept that you are struggling with alcoholism, but it's not okay to accept that you are an alcoholic. Amen. It's okay to accept that you are struggling with diabetes, but it's not okay to accept that you are a diabetic. Because when you accept that label as who you are, you lower your defense from resisting that thing and resisting those symptoms and resisting those labels and resisting those consequences. And then you become, you used to be a prisoner to the addiction itself, but then you, but what's worse than being a prisoner to the addiction is being imprisoned to the label that you are that thing. Boy, I wonder if I'm in the right church here today. I mean, I, I might have to go down the street. I might have to go down the street and find me the right church that's going to listen to this and say, is this making sense to anybody so far today? All right, you are more. Say, I am more. So how do we walk in this? How do we walk in the more? 
that God created us to be? How do we walk in the more than conquerors life that God calls us? How do we walk in this being more, not just doing more or having more? I'm not about that. I'm not about doing more or having more. I'm about helping you understand that you are more. Because you know what? When you know that you are more, you'll end up doing more better things and you'll have better things. But it's because you know your worth and you know your value and you know that you were not redeemed with silver and gold, which perishes, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of the lamb. You were not redeemed with something that man made. You were redeemed with something that God made. You were redeemed with what God is. You were redeemed with his blood. You were redeemed with his life. You were redeemed with his breath. You were redeemed with his grace. You were redeemed with his love. You've been redeemed with something that money can't buy, people can't create, man can't destroy, man can't earn, man can't deserve. You are more. Say that I'm more. So how do we walk in this? Well, I'm, the first way that we walk in this, I'm going to use a phrase that's used in real estate, which is the greatest advice you could ever take when it comes to buying real estate. And what is that advice? It's one word. Location, location, location. Well, that's three words, but it's location, location, location. Everybody say location, location, location. Some of you said it once, some of you said it twice, but I'm telling you, we're not leaving here till we say it thrice. Ready? Location, location, location. You say, why is that so important? Because based on where something is located, determines its value, like a certain house or a certain building located um, in Barrington Hills, a certain house located in, Barring in Barrington Hills. <laughs> I can make fun of them because I was one of them. We all were when we had our church in Barrington Hills. <laughs> but you know, a house located there might be the same house there as it is in Hoffman Estates, but it's worth more in Barrington Hills. Why? Location, location, location. An office building in Schaumburg might be worth one thing, but an office building on Michigan Avenue is going to be worth far more. Why? Location, location, location. It's because of where it is. How many know when you go to a, when you go to a, uh, to a mall you're not familiar with, what do you do when you're looking for, like, I don't go to the mall to shop, like, to look around. Like, we, we all are past that, right? We can look around on our computer or on our phone, right? And you go, hey, I wonder what they got here. If you go into the mall, you're going because you have one specific store in mind that you're going to to buy those particular shoes or that particular underwear or that particular whatever, you know. And so what, so what do you do when you don't know the, how it's all laid out? You go to the information map. And what do you do? You look, oh, okay, so I need to go to 308A, which is on the third level in the A section of the building. And so you say, well, where is that, right? Because <laughs> where is that? Because you're not going to get there unless you know where you are. And so they have this little arrow and this little circle, and it says, you are here. And that little locator of where you are is what's going to determine how effective you're going to be at getting to where you want to get to. And so this is what I mean by location, location, location. You got to know where you are. You got to locate yourself first, because that's what's going to get you to your destiny, to your destination, to the place that God has for you. You got to know where you are. And where are you? You are in Christ. Amen. Amen. And this brings me back to the verse that I got to tell you, but I didn't get to show you because of our, our screens were down last week. But go back with me to the scripture in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, in the message translation of the Bible. Ephesians 1, 11, look at what he says. He says, it's in Christ. Everybody say, it's in Christ. It's in Christ. He says, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Who we are and what we're living for is all based on location, location, location. You are here. You might think, man, you don't know where I've been. You don't know where I'm, what I'm going through. You don't know where I'm at in life. You know, 
You, you don't know where I'm at with my finances. You don't know where I'm at with my health. You don't know where I'm at with my family. It's all screwed up. It's all messed up. That may be where, that may be where, you, where the circumstances that are around you, but you need to know something. There's, you are at a different location than where you think. What location? You are in Christ. Where are you? You're in him. And where is he? He's seated at the Father's right hand. And where are we? Ephesians 1, uh, 20. 1 and 22 and Ephesians 2 verse 6 says you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You say, no, I'm, I'm seated at Life Changers Church. Physically, you're here right now. Physically, you're watching in your home right now. You're watching in your bathtub right now. I don't know where you're watching from, but <laughs> wherever you think you are is just your circumstance. But where you truly are in God's view and from God's point of view is you are in Christ. You are seated with him in heavenly places. You are more than a conqueror. You are the head and not the tail. We have to locate ourselves so that we can know where we are and get to where God has for us. And the place that you are is you are in Christ. Location, location, location. And that's why we all need that. We need kind of that marker. You are here. The you are here marker in the mall, on the mall's map. We need that you are here marker in our mind, in our brain, in our head. We need that marker that reminds us continually, you are in Christ. Man, I feel so low. You are in Christ. I feel like I'm never going to make it. You are in Christ. You don't know where I'm at. You are in Christ. You don't know what I'm going through. You are in Christ. You don't know what I'm suffering. You are in Christ. You don't know what I've dealt with. You are in Christ. You don't know what people are doing to me. You are in Christ. You don't know what arrows are being flung my way. You are in Christ. You don't know what people have said about me. You are in Christ. You don't know the racism I feel. You are in Christ. You don't know the trouble because I'm a woman. You are in Christ. You don't know the trouble that I'm going through because I'm Middle Eastern. You are in Christ. You know the trouble I'm going through because I'm break, broke. You are in Christ. You don't know the trouble I'm going through because I got this physical sickness, this disability, this, 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 this deficiency about my body. You are in Christ. You are hidden with him. And when the devil is looking for you, he's got to go through him to get to you. And he cannot go through him. He cannot get to him. That's why no, that's why no weapon formed against you can prosper, because you're hidden with Christ. You're in him. You're in him. Look. We got to dispel the notion that the reason no weapon formed against us is because we're so strong in our faith or because we're so powerful or because we've been Christians so long or because we don't smoke or we don't drink. You know, and, and frankly, you know what? I know some of you, as soon as you get in your car, you're going to be lighting one up. And I had, and I don't even care. And the preachers that get all bent out of shape over it. They're probably just bent out of shape because they're lighting it up and they don't get to do it in front of people like you do. And I don't really care if they're lighting it up either. We're so external in our view of things. Well, did you see that thing? Did you see how long Derek's hair was? Really? Have you seen how long Jesus' hair was? Well, but I just don't think we should, you know, be acting like that and looking like that. And I, why are we looking at stuff externally? It's because we don't know where we are. We're in Christ. You're in Christ and I'm in Christ. Yeah, but you know those. But what about that? You know, the, the, the guy that's dealing with this sin or the girl that's dealing with that sin. And I'm not dealing with that. Yeah, but you know what? You know what you're dealing with? You say, oh, well, that that guy's dealing with homosexuality, man. That's an obvious sin. But your gossip is real subtle. Mm. Well, don't get me started now. I'll sing this message to you. I'll... Mm -hmm. <laughs> location, location, location. The second thing I want to talk to you about besides location, where are you, by the way, location wise, where are you? Oh, you don't know where I'm at, man. Where are you? You don't know where I'm at financially. Where are you? In you know where I'm at physically. Where are you? In Man, you don't know where I'm at in my marriage. Where are you? In Man, you don't know what I'm going through emotionally. Where are you? In Thank you. You're in Christ. Location, location, location. And the value of a thing is based on its location in real estate. So guess what? Your value is based on location. You're in Christ. Wow. You are worth so much. 
because you are more. The second thing I want to talk to you about this morning is something that every one of us possesses, but we don't realize how powerful it is. It's more important than our past. It's more powerful than our past. It's more powerful than our education. It's more powerful than our money. It's more powerful than our circumstances, our failures, our successes. It's more powerful than our talent. It's more powerful than what people say or think about us. It's more powerful and more important than our gifts, our skill, or our beauty. You know what it is? This thing that we possess that's more powerful than any of these things, it's our attitude. We all possess an attitude that determines the outcome of our life. It determines the trajectory of our life. You see, a plane may presently be on the ground, but because, it under, because the pilot and the, and, the, and the science behind it operates in the law of thrust and lift, it may, be, it may be on the ground right now, but through thrust, through the force of thrust and lift, it's able to lift itself out of the circumstance that it's in, above the ground that it's on, and it's able to then achieve an altitude because of its attitude. And we've all heard the saying many times, we understand it, and it's, it's, it's overused, but it's, it's underappreciated, and it's attitude determines altitude. That how high you go in life is determined by your attitude, not by what you, what you were born with or what you grew up with. It's attitude. Attitude is more powerful than success. It's more powerful than failure. It's more powerful than your circumstances. And a negative attitude is the very thing, the first thing that hinders us from experiencing our desires, our dreams, and our destiny. Our attitude. It hinders your ability to use your gift. What is attitude? It's your mindset. And your mindset that's conceived from either knowing or not knowing your identity. From knowing or not knowing who you are. Or for, from forgetting. That's why the Bible constantly tells us, remember. Remember what God has done for you. Do not forget any of his benefits. He pardons all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. You see, an attitude is a mindset that takes precedence over all other facts. And I've shared this with you before, but I want you to hear this again. It's a mindset that takes precedence over all other facts. Say that. Say attitude is a mindset that takes precedence over all other facts. Someone said the master in the art of living makes little distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his information and his recreation his love and his faith. He hardly knows the difference of which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence at whatever he does, leaving others to decide whether he is working or playing. To him, he's always doing both because of his attitude. Because of his attitude. Because of his attitude. When I'm playing, I'm working. When I'm working, I'm playing. It's the same because of attitude. So many people are just missing life because they're working for the weekend. They're working for vacation. And then what do they need when they're done with their vacation? A vacation from their vacation. Because they've compartmentalized their attitude. Like they go, oh, I got to be at work. So you have an attitude that you're a slave to work rather than I can't wait till I'm off. Like you're off. Like what were you on? It's an attitude. See, if you have an attitude that, man, I'm more, I am more, then you're at your job and you can have a lightheartedness. You're at your job and you can be happy. You're at your job and you can be fulfilled. You're at, your jo- you're at home and you can be fulfilled. You're at work, you can be fulfilled. Many people have, have retired from their job of 40 or 50 years and they get depressed because they don't, have, they don't have anything to do, and it's because their whole identity was wrapped up in their position or their job or their schedule, rather than knowing that they are something, 
rather than that they do something. They've, they've lowered them, they've limited themselves to what they do rather than who they are. And we've got to unlimit, we've got to take these shackles off and realize, man, you are more. And so when you're at your job or when you're going through a trial or when you're going through fire or when you're going through a good time or a bad time, you can be the same because of your attitude. So whether the plane goes through uh, tur turbulence or whether it's going through the, the low air or the high air, low pressure, high pressure, your attitude causes you to be the one who's able to rise above whatever the turbulence is or endure whatever the turbulence is you can make it through anything because your attitude and this is what we all need in our lives to rid ourselves of that negative attitude and to adopt an attitude that we are more I am more you are more say it I am more, I am more. we're going somewhere with this now let me talk to you for a moment about the 1090 rule so this is the next thing that'll help you with this whole concept of how do we live out this more that God calls us since God says you are more, how do we live this? How do we experience this? By understanding the 1090 rule. And what is that? The 1090 rule is really simple. It's this, and maybe the numbers aren't exact, but it's, it's in generally speaking, that life is 10% of what happens to us and 90% of how we react to it. Life is 10% of what happens to us and 90% of how we react to it. That's why the same group of people can have the same, the same kids could have the same parents and one of the kids succeeds and one of them fails. One of them blames his upbringing and one of them thanks his upbringing. One of them uh, makes excuses, another one makes opportunities. It's attitude. It's the 1090 rule. Both of them had the same thing happen to them. That's why one person can be abused as, the, as a child and be bitter and angry at all human beings for the rest of their life. And one person could be abused as a child and become a, uh, an advocate for others who have been ab abused and start an organization for others that have been abused and counsel and encourage and minister others that have been abused. They both had the same thing happen to them. And this is why the 1090 rule needs to be something you operate by. Life is 10% of what's happened to you, but 90% of how you react to what's happened to you. You see, it's really important that we get a, a hold of something because what happened to you, that's a fact. What happened to you? You were, you were mistreated, you were abused, you were, you were born on the wrong side of the tracks, you were born a, a, a certain color or a certain race or you were born a certain gender and you, it's a fact, you were born that way. Maybe you were born, you were born um, with a, a proclivity towards or a, a, a bent towards alcohol. You were born with a bent growing up towards drugs or a bent towards um, feeling rejected all the time or a bent towards homosexuality or this or that. And, and you're born with that bent, but that does not mean that you need to accept that that's who God made you. Listen, God accepts you wherever you're at in life. God accepts you no matter what you've done in life. But he doesn't leave us in the same condition that he finds us. And if we would just be willing to say, you know what? He's the potter and I'm the clay. And you know what the potter did in Jeremiah chapter 13 or chapter 18? The Bible says that the potter was working the, with the clay on the wheel. And while he was working with the clay on the wheel, the clay was marred and the clay was damaged while in his hands. So what did he do? He made it again on the potter's wheel. So God doesn't reject you because your clay is marred. And in fact, even when you're clay is marred and your life is damaged, you're still in God's hands and just stay in his hands. And obviously he's never going to let you go. But, you know, you know how we get we. Life, you know, starts going like this, you know, like if somebody somebody can give you a massage, you know, a massage. You know, we most people don't know what a sports massage is because they're they're looking for a you know, some spoiled massage. They're looking for, you know, 
They're looking for this. They're looking to be rubbed and oiled. And, oh, just rubbed. But a real massage that is for you to really loosen your muscles, and lo it's like, oh, and you're like, oh, 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 mm. And if you just go with it, this is how you start moving and grooving in life. And God's molding you. And you can be like, ah, or you can be like, mm, 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 mm. Don't make me do that again, because you'll put your phone on. And <laughs> look, at my, look at this crazy guy, man. You believe he's got a church? Don't fight it. Don't resist it. Let him mold you. Let him reshape you. You're in his hands. It's not like he's not saying, go fix yourself and then come back to me when you cleaned it all up. He's like, just stay in my hands. I'll, I'll mold you. I'll shape you. Some of it's going to hurt. Some of it's going to feel good. Some of it's going to hurt. But in the end, it's going to produce good. And I like to say all the time, don't do what feels good in life. Do what produces good in life. So... 1090 rule. What happened to you, that's a fact. But how you react to it, that's your attitude. You can't control what has happened to you, but you can control your attitude. It's the 90, 10 rule. 10% 10 is what life, life, what life has done, what's happened to us, but 90% is how we react. That's our attitude. That's our attitude. And we know we can have an attitude as a victim, victim or a victor, we can have an attitude of gratitude and gratefulness or complaining and whining because we don't have more of what we'd want. And, and why do people complain? Because they, they, they want more because they feel like they are less. I got to have more so I don't feel like I'm less. As soon as you start feeling like you're more because you are, you'll need less. You won't need more to make you feel like you're not less. More will come to you because you are more and you're like a magnet that attracts more goodness and more blessing and more favor because you know who you are. I am more. You are more. Amen? Say that. I am more. It's something we need to deal with when it comes to failure in life because we've all, we've all failed at some time at one thing or another. But failure is an event. It's not a person. You are not a failure. You may have failed, but you are not a failure. Yesterday really ended last night. Yesterday is not today. Failure is not you. You are what God says you are, regardless of what you have failed at. And the reason people don't move forward and don't rise to their full potential and their full worth is because they see themselves as a failure. They see themselves small, like the 10 spies that came back and said, we were like grasshoppers in our sight so we became like grasshoppers in their sight. And you can't, you got to stop seeing yourself small. You are more. You got to stop seeing yourself average. You're better than average. You're better than, you're, you're not even just more than average. You're more because you are what God said you are. You are more than a conqueror. You are more victorious than you've ever experienced yet. And the more you line your thinking up with that belief that you are more, the more victory is going to start showing up in your life. Because as a man thinks... So is he. Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, you're not what you struggle with. I said it to you earlier. I want to say it again. You might struggle with alcoholism, but you don't have to identify yourself as an alcoholic. I know some people will say that. I disagree with that. Maybe you're, and you don't have to agree with me on that point. It's, it's, it, it is kind of a technicality, so I don't want to get, get caught up in it. But it's important that you begin to identify yourself with what God says you are. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner, but now you're the righteousness of God. You, you're not broke, busted, and disgusted. You have all things through Christ. You can do all things through Christ, and my God shall supply all your needs. You have an abundance. You have God's provision. You are why? Because you are blessed. It's not something you have, it's something you are. He says you are blessed coming in and blessed going out. It's who you are, it's not what you have. 
You're blessed coming in, blessed going out. The reason why blessing comes, in, comes to you when you go in and blessing comes to you when you go out is because that's who you are. You're blessed. You're the head and not the tail. You're above. You didn't win, which made you the head. You are the head, and that's why you win. You're above only. You are above only and not beneath. It's location, man. Location, location, location. And it's attitude. Never become your problem. You are not your problem. That's not who you are. You are in Christ. And he is not a failure. His love never fails. His faith never fails. His promises never fail. And if you belong to Christ, you never fail. You might you might fall, you might stumble, but you're not a failure. That's not who you are. You're in him. Failure is an event. It ends as soon as it's over. Failure is not a person. But success is a person. You are a success because that's who God said you are and you're more. Now let's break down. I want to just take you to one more passage of scripture because we have to stop seeing ourselves under the curse of average and look, go over to First Chronicles chapter four, verse nine and ten. Now this is a very famous passage of scripture as well. It's turned into what people refer to as the prayer of Jabez. But there's something about this prayer that it came out of his pain. And this is what makes Jabez such a great character to me in the Bible, because it says notice what it says. It says now Jabez in verse nine, first Chronicles, chapter four, verse nine. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. In other words, they had the same parents, but he was more honorable than his brothers. You could have the same parents, but you could be more honorable than your brothers. And I don't mean that you're that you try to be better than them or compete with them. But he was more honorable than his brothers. What does this word honor mean? He was elevated above how he grew up. He was elevated beyond his limitations. He was elevated beyond his pain. What made him more honorable? What made him a person who God elevated? What made him a person that God raised up? What caused Jabez to rise to his true worth and his true purpose? What caused him to rise. Well, look at what it says. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers and his mother called his name Jabez, which is translated as because I bore him in pain. So can you imagine his he gave pain to his mother as he was being born? Like, think about this. Who doesn't give pain to their mother as they're being born? And then some measure of pain every year after that. And but she but she mistakenly identified him with the pain he caused her. So something was wrong with her. Because because every woman has had some pain unless you were just like knocked out and put to sleep while you gave birth. You had some sort of pain. I mean, don't make me get all scientific now. <laughs> but something was wrong with her that she would take out her pain on him and actually remind him by calling him Jabez, reminding him of the pain that she's caused him for being alive. And so some people believe that they they bring pain everywhere they go and that they're the cause of you got to realize something. You know what? I get it. If you really hurt somebody, then you do have responsibility to make that right. But nobody has to live under the control of what somebody did to them. Nobody has to live like that. That's a choice. That's not your destiny. Somebody might blame you for why they feel the way they feel. And they may even point to something legitimate that you did that made them feel that way. But they don't have to stay that way. They might have felt that way as an immediate reaction, but they don't have to keep feeling that way. That's a choice. A reflex. There's nothing we can do about a reflex, but a learned way of thinking and blaming is something we can deal with. Am I in the right place here still today? So 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 this guy, so this mother names him pain, gives him this 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 complex, this inferiority complex. You know who you are? You're a pain. You're a, you've been a pain in my rear since you since you came out of my body and you've been a pain ever since. In fact, I'm calling you pain. You bring me pain every time I look at you. It reminds me of the pain that you cause. And like I said, teachers say this over kids and say you'll never mount anything. Parents say this sometimes over kids. You'll never mount anything. People say that and they bully each other. You'll never mount anything. But you know what? It's not about what people say to us or what people do to us. It's a choice we have to make whether we're going to be more honorable 
than how we grew up and more honorable than what whether we're going to rise above what people have labeled us. And so there are several things that made Jabez more honorable than his brothers born from the same parents. But they had it. They, they ended up with a different in a different destination and they ended up living a whole different way. And what made this man distinct is he says in verse 10, he does something about it in verse 10. So Jabez prayed, he called out to God and said, oh, that you would bless me indeed and that you would enlarge my territory. In other words, Jabez does not accept the 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 the, the victim mentality of being a pain and living in pain the rest of his life. He does something about his pain. He does something about the label. He does something about what he's been defined as. What does he do? He goes to God about it and he says, you know what? I'm not going to stay this way. I'm not going to stay average. I'm not going to stay mediocre. I'm not going to stay defined by my pain or my name or my parents or my upbringing or my brothers or my sisters or my limitations or my color or my race or my politics. I'm not going to be defined by any of that. I'm not going to be defined by my education. I'm not going to be defined by my upbringing. I'm not going to be defined by my gifts or my talents or my abilities. I'm going up. I'm going to God. I'm calling on the God of Israel. Oh, that you have blessed me indeed. He says, you know what? What man screwed up, God's going to unscrew. What man messed up, God's going to unmess. What man did me wrong, God's going to do me right. What man did to me, God's going to undo to me. God's going to fix it. Whatever you broke, God's going to fix. Whatever man broke, God's going to fix. Oh, God bless me indeed. We got to start praying like that. We got to stop praying. Oh, yeah. Oh, if it be your will, oh, if you do, just, just, do, just do me a little favor, Lord. If he can do you a little favor, he can do you a lot of favor. Amen. If he can do you a little favor, he can do you a big favor. Oh, God, that you would just give me a little bit of territory. No, he said, oh, God, enlarge my territory. You go, you know what? You know what? You know why Jabez was more honorable than his brothers? Jabez was more honorable than his brothers for several reasons, because even though he grew up in pain, he didn't allow his pain to keep him a victim. Though he grew up in pain, he refused to be defined by his pain. He refused to be defined by his peers. He refused to be defined by his brothers. He refused to be defined by his parents. He refused to be defined by his past. You know what made him more honorable? That his pain caused him to cry out to God. He called on the God of Israel. He started out, oh! But if you start out, oh! That's not like, hey, are you there, Lord? He starts out with passion. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. You see this boldness. He's going. He's not going to the throne of 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 earning. He's not going to the throne of deserving. He's not going to the throne of pay, pay, pay God off. He's going to the throne of grace. He's going big. He's not going home. He's going big. He's going, man, mm, give me this territory, Lord. Give me more. Look, I grew up limited. The word pain actually is translated as the word limited in the Bible. So he he was he was born in limitation, but he went to the God of unlimitation. I don't know if that's a word, but he went to the God of unlimitation. You got to go to the God of unlimitation. You got to go to the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The silver is his. The gold is his. He's got it all. He does it all. He can do it all. All things are possible to him. And we got to go to him. He's the throne of grace is open. Let's go boldly. Let's go big. He goes bold and he goes big. We got to go bold and we got to go big. Say, I'm going bold. Bless me indeed. I'm going big, enlarge my territory. I'm going further. Let your hand be with me. And I'm going to be used by God and make maximum impact. Lord, use me that I might not cause pain. And look at what the Bible says. And God granted what he requested. Woo! That's our God. That's your God. Jabez had the same God that you have, but you get to go right to the throne of grace. Jabez kind of has to stand out behind and he's got to stand between a priest and him. But our priest, Jesus, is seated with the father in heavenly places and seated with the father in heaven at the throne of God. And we get to go boldly by the blood of the lamb right to Jesus, right to the father. And he said up to now, you've asked the father nothing in my name, but ask and you shall receive that your joy would be made full. 
You know why this man was more honorable than his than his brothers? Because he didn't become a victim of his pain. He did not be defined by he would not be defined by his pain. And he went to God about it. We have been going to people about it for too long. We have been going to our mamas about it. And we have been going to the mamas of our dramas about it. And we've been going to our friends about it. And we've been going to ex-members about it. And we've been going to people that complain about it. And we've been going to negative people about it. And, if you, and you know what? Those people cannot bless you indeed. Those people cannot enlarge your territory. Those people's hand cannot be upon you. And those people cannot use you to bring healing and not pain. But my God, the God of the Bible, the God of the New Testament, the God of heaven and earth, he is waiting for you to come. Be bold, go big, and watch what God will do. And you know what God said? He said, let me tell you what I'll do. Thank you for, go thank you for going bold, and thank you for going big, but let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do Ephesians 3.20 on you. I'm pulling an F320, E-P-H dot 320. I'm going to do exceeding abundantly above and beyond all that you can ask or think according to the power of my love that's working on the inside of you. Yeah. Woo! You got to, hey, if you're ready to go big, if you're ready to go bold, if you're ready to go where no man has gone before, live long and prosper, stand to your feet.